Settle down and let's start talking a little bit more about induction. Now, induction itself is somewhat. Uh, I mean, it's it's easy. Okay, it's if I have a wire, if I know if I have a wire loop, if I know the flux through it, it's easy to calculate. We have been calculating induced currents all the time. But what's more interesting is that let's say that I'm a poor electron on this. Uh, wire loop and somehow let's say that I have a very concentrated magnetic field P that's passing through the center of this loop so I'm not even seeing the magnetic field itself now the interesting thing is if this magnetic field changes with time somehow this poor electron will get some kinetic energy it will start moving with velocity v this is doubly interesting right this is almost doubly magical first thing is that we know that magnetic field creates a force which is perpendicular to the velocity of the electron all the time. So for example, if I have an electron at rest, a magnetic field will create no forces on it. And the second thing is that this change in the magnetic field must be, maybe, even very far away. It's only the total loop I'm considering in this example. I'm saying the flux through the full loop while the electron lives only on the edge it somehow feels the change of the magnetic field anywhere inside the loop okay so first is how come does the magnetic field actually accelerate the electron second is that B may be far away So, what is really the microscopic mechanism for induction? What happens? What creates these currents? And the answer maybe is not super surprising. Okay. What accelerates an electron? What can cause currents to flow? Not magnetic field, but electric field. Okay. After a while, Faraday understood just that. He said, even without all these wires lying around, if I change the magnetic field in free space, I induce an electric field. Okay. So, even in free space, change of magnetic field creates an electric field. Okay. So what happens really with this loop wire is that when I change the magnetic field through it, I actually, the change in this magnetic field creates a circulating electric field. And this circulating electric field causes the electrons to move that causes the induced current in the loop. But even if I don't have the wire there, if I have this free space, I have a magnet and I'm changing magnetic field as a function of time, I actually create circular electric fields around this magnetic changing magnetic field. Now, this is kind of strange because the way to state this law is as follows. If I integrate electric field 
over any closed path. I choose some path and integrate the electric field through this closed path. And to show the closed path, I put that sexy uh, circle onto my integral sign. Now, at first sight, all of you remember the definition of the potential. The definition of the potential was exactly this, well, with the minus sign, e dot dl from one point to the other point gave me the, the potential difference between those two points. What's the potential difference if I do this on a loop? Should be zero, right? I'm back to my same old point. However, when there is a changing magnetic field in the system, that's no longer the case. It turns out when you integrate E over a loop, this is exactly minus d by dt, the magnetic flux through the loop. And minus sign here tells me about the direction of circulation of my imaginary loop. So this would be a positive direction. So basically you can't phi to be in this positive direction. Now this is actually, again I, I should state this, this is important. No. Electric field is induced even when there are no wire loops to carry a current. You remember how we defined electric field? We defined it sort of as a mathematical convenience. We said instead of writing F all the time, why don't I separate this Q out and call the rest electric field? But after a while, when we were talking about capacitors, we said, hey, maybe electric field is not just a mathematical convenience. Maybe it's a physical quantity. Apparently, it can store energy, creating an electric field in a certain region stores energy proportional to E square in that region. You remember the energy density was one half epsilon zero E square. And now I'm saying something even more interesting. I'm saying changing magnetic field can cause an electric field without the presence of any charges, anything else. Two weeks later, I'm going to state just the converse. I'll say changing electric field in time can create magnetic fields. And now it becomes a feedback loop. I'm changing my electric field that creates a magnetic field, which is changing in time, which creates an electric field, which is changing in time, which creates a magnetic field. So this feedback loop without the presence of any charges around, actually can support what we call electromagnetic waves or light. That is going to be the nature of light. Okay. So this is one, this Faraday's law is one part, important part of how an electromagnetic wave propagates in space. Okay. Now, so, What should we do? We should uh, solve one example. Let's say that I have a solenoid.
let's say the total length of the solenoid is L and it has n turns of wire let's say that the radius okay I should draw a cylinder onto that the radius of the solenoid is R and let's say the current through the solenoid is I0 T over tau okay so it's and tau I0 and tau are constants What I would like to find out is find the magnetic field and the electric field. Everywhere in space as a function of time. Hmm. Now, first things first, if I'm given a current and if I'm given some wires, how do I calculate the magnetic field? I have two methods, one was Ampere's law, the other was Biot-Savart's law. If I assume that my solenoid is long enough and it's tightly wound enough, I can use Ampere's law to calculate the magnetic field. Okay, so that's what I will do. Assuming a long and tightly wound solenoid <coughs> I'll do the following I will take an ampere loop like this I will write my Ampere's law B dot DL is mu zero times I in now if the length of this Ampere loop is L I in will be what? each current, each wire carries a current I in total there are n turns so per unit length there are n divided by the total length terms times the length of my ampere loop that's going to be I in how about B dot DL I know that inside the solenoid B is constant outside it is zero this was a good approximation if I had a tightly wound and large solenoid so this is going to be just B magnitude times L in other words B times L is I times N divided by L times L times mu zero or B is going to be mu zero n over L times I of T I of T was given to us so it's going to be mu zero n over L times I 
I zero T divided by tau. So what does the magnetic field do? The magnetic field is increasing in time as my current is increasing. But now if I look at the solenoid from the top, So if I look at the system from the top, and this is B inside, B outside is zero. So if I look at the system from the top, I'll see this cylinder of radius R, and if the current is running counterclockwise, the magnetic field is going to be uniform and coming towards me, right? And this magnetic field is increasing in time, which means the flux through this circuit is increasing in time, which means actually to keep this flux increasing, I need to supply some voltage to the circuit. Wait a moment. Let's move slowly. First, how do I run this current? Well, probably I attach this solenoid to some voltage source. So there is some residual resistance of the wires. So probably I can run this current by a very small battery if the wires have small current. But if I'm trying to increase my current with time, that small battery is not going to be enough. Why? Because I actually have to do work against the induced electric field. Let's find the electric field inside and outside my solenoid. When my flux is changing with time, all right? Now, let's start with the outside. What was Faraday's law? It told me integral E dot DL is minus D phi B DT. Now, I am going to take a loop that has radius RL, or let me call it RC. And I've cleaned my nice solenoid out of the picture. Okay, so what is E dot DL? E dot DL on this loop, at each point E and DL will be parallel to each other. So this is going to be just 2 pi RC times E magnitude. What is the flux inside the solenoid? The flux is only within the solenoid. The magnetic field is only within the solenoid. It's not outside. So it's going to be minus d by dt area of the solenoid pi r square times p of t. Okay? Hmm. So the electric field is going to be 1 over 2 pi RC in the minus one. Pi R square is a constant. Now B of T I'm going to write my expression mu zero n over L I zero D by DT T over tau. Right. So this derivative is quite easy. It's just going to give me one or one over tau here. So the electric field 
1 over 2 pi rc pi r square mu 0 n i 0 over l divided by tau. And what happened to my minus sign? As I'm writing the absolute value, I should really not care about the minus signs. Okay. But what does this minus tell me? It tells me that the real electric field is circulating not in the positive sense, but the electric field is circulating in the opposite sense. It's opposing the rotation of the current that's causing the magnetic field. That is what Lenz's law tells me. The generated electric field actually opposes the current. So you need to now do more work. And it's actually quite interesting, right? I have a solenoid. Magnetic field is confined only inside the solenoid. But when I change this magnetic field, there is an electric field that's circulating the solenoid. Well, it's decaying as 1 over r as I go away from this solenoid. But nonetheless, there is an electric field outside the solenoid when magnetic field inside is time dependent. Now, how about electric field inside the solenoid? Hmm. Well, let me redraw my system. So here is my solenoid. The magnetic field is coming towards me uniformly inside the solenoid. Now, I will choose a loop which is smaller than the solenoid itself. So I will actually choose a loop for which E dot DL is going to be minus D by DT phi B. There is nothing different in the calculation of E dot DL that is determined by the symmetry of the system. So it's going to give me E magnitude times 2 pi RC. How about the magnetic field, I'm sorry, magnetic flux inside the loop? Now it's going to be different. Why? Because I'm only interested in the magnetic flux inside this loop. Okay? So what is it going to be? d by dt, not pi times r square of the solenoid, but pi times rc square of only my loop. Okay. I think I'm losing the attention of at least half of the class, so maybe it would be a good idea for me to uh, repeat all this Faraday's law again in, 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 the, in Wednesday's lecture. Nonetheless, I'm going to finish this example. Okay. Pi r squared times b of t. So what I find is e magnitude is 2 pi rc minus d by dt pi r square mu 0 n divided by l i 0 t over tau. So that's a very simple derivative to evaluate. And I don't care about the minus signs at all because I'm looking at the magnetic field, uh, to the, the, the magnitude of the field. Pi is cancelled, that should be rc square. I have RC over 2 mu 0 n over L I 0 over tau for RC inside the solenoid. So if I plot once again
Here is the current. I'm running through my solenoid. What does it do? It creates a magnetic field. Even if the current is constant in time. Okay. That we found by Ampere's law. But now, if the magnetic field itself is time dependent, now I actually see something else. I see a circulating, well let me draw this better, a circulating electric field. And which direction is the electric field circulating? It's circulating opposite to the current that's causing the magnetic field here. Okay. Well, I should be very clear here. It's not actually opposing the... For this example, it is opposing the uh, loop current. That's because my loop current is increasing. If the loop current were decreasing, the electric field will support the loop current. That is the essence of Lenz's law. Anytime you have a loop that creates a magnetic field, it becomes hard to change the current in that loop. Okay. The current in that loop will have some extra factor that has to be supplied to create a change in the current of that loop. Now, I'm actually going to quantify this more. Let me just leave Faraday's law for a moment. Let me go back to this concept of induction. What happens? If I have a nice solenoid here, and I actually take another, maybe more tightly wound, circular loop here. Okay. I'm trying to draw this with some. degree of nicety, but I think it looks worse now. So, let's retry. Let's treat this as a solid object. Okay, let's just say two loops, maybe. Let's say this is I1. And here, I have another wire loop. Here is the thing. So, does everyone understand the geometry? Here I have a very nice tightly wound solenoid and I actually have a big wire loop around this. I'm going to do the following experiment. I will put a voltmeter here. So it's actually an open circuit. No current can run in that circuit. And I'm going to change the current in the solenoid. When I run a current in the solenoid, what would that create? It would create a magnetic field B inside the solenoid. If I change that magnetic field. I will change the flux through the solenoid, but I will change the flux not only through the solenoid, but I will change that flux also for this extra loop, right? So if I call this V2, what will V2 be? Actually, the magnitude I'm not carrying around. It must be exactly D 
phi b by dt. Right? Now this is great. Why? Because what's d phi b by dt? This phi b is controlled by i1. In other words, if I know, let me call this flux phi b, right? If I can change phi b by changing i1, I can control the voltage on the other circuit. Let's quantify this more. Anytime I have, so let me write this in other words, changing I1 with time creates a V2. Let's be more clear about this. Anytime I have two circuits, let's say this is I1, and here I'll have another circuit, another loop. I have no idea what that loop looks like. Anytime I run a current I through the first loop, it's going to create uh, it is going to create a magnetic field. Some of these magnetic field lines will also cross through the second circuit. Right. Now the flux magnetic flux on the second circuit will depend on current in the first circuit. So if I actually increase the current on the first circuit, I will have more flux on the second circuit. We quantify the ratio of proportionality between current in one circuit and the flux in the other circuit by a number which we call M. This is called the mutual inductance of the loops. What do I mean by that? I mean that if I, okay, or what does that signify, this mutual inductance? Mutual inductance tells me how closely two loops are coupled. Right. If almost all the flux created by one loop is shared by the other loop, this mutual inductance is going to be a big number. On the other hand, if I have two solenoids which are very, very far apart from each other, only a small number of field lines will actually go through the other loop. In that case, my mutual inductance will be small. All right? So, now, why is this important? Because what will be voltage on my second loop, the voltage on my second loop will be d by dt phi 2, which is going to be m times di1 by dt. So this m, the mutual inductance, tells me the following. It tells me how much voltage I can create on the second loop by changing the current in the first loop. Okay. So actually, if you want more mutual inductance, for example, if you're trying to read my ID card at the parking place, you want to create the large mutual inductance between my ID card and whatever circuit is inside this reader. Okay. And how do I increase the mutual inductance between my ID card and the circuit? I make my card go as close as possible to the reader. And I orient it not perpendicular to the reader, but flat to the reader so that the circuits share most of the magnetic flux. 
Okay. Now, here is something. So this mutual inductance is actually easy to understand. Mutual inductance tells me how much flux passes through one loop due to the other loop. What's more interesting is that there is another concept. Okay, maybe you should ask the question before I end. Excellent question. Great question. Now, what's the flux and what's the, when I talk about Lenz's law, the electromotive force on any loop? It's related to the total flux, right? So when I wrap this black coil onto the solenoid, does it share the flux with the solenoid? It does, right? So if this flux changes, that there should be a voltage around that. But how does this happen? You're right. Magnetic field seen by these black lines, by this wire, is zero. So how come is there a voltage there? And the answer is due to Faraday's law. Even outside the solenoid, there is an electric field. So what happens is that, okay, it doesn't go up when I do it on the screen. Now, when I change the magnetic field here, an electric field is induced on these black wires which creates this voltage. Okay? Good question. But now, here is something maybe a little bit harder to understand. Let me go back to this picture. If I'm trying to change the current on the solenoid, the current on the solenoid will, if, when it's changed, will cause a change in the magnetic field, which will cause an electric field, which is opposing the current or the changing current. Okay? It means I actually have to supply more voltage to keep the current the same. Maybe this has all become too qualitative. Let's put in a little bit more quantitative definitions. I will say the following. Even if I have only a single conductor, single wire loop if you want. When I run current through it, I will generate a magnetic field. Which means there will be a flux through my system. And if phi b, this total flux changes in time, there must be an extra voltage here. This voltage, V1, would be proportional to d phi b dt. But this flux must be proportional to the current running through the system. So in other words, I will induce currents not only in other conductors, but I will be inducing current, extra current, even in the same conductor. So that is called the self-inductance of a circuit. Okay. And it's shown by the symbol L. So this is going to be d by dt times L times I1 or the voltage around my solenoid will be proportional to the time rate of change of the current through the solenoid. Let's calculate this L. This is very much analogous to capacitance. That's why this self-inductance or it's sometimes called just inductance is very similar to capacitance. Let's first calculate it 
But you, even at this stage, you see, and what does this equation look like? What was the I V, the relation between I and V for the capacitor? The current on a capacitor was C times dV dt. For the inductor, it's just the reverse. The voltage on the inductor is proportional to time rate of change of current. For the capacitor, the current on the capacitor was time, or time rate of change of voltage. Okay? Good. Let's calculate the inductance. So, how much of a voltage do I need to supply to a solenoid to create or to create a changing I in that system? Let's, let's do it again. Let me take my solenoid. And I'll say that it's in a it's wrapped around the cylinder of length L and radius R, but I'm not going to I'll actually use something else. I'll call this H. L will be the uh, inductance here. Now here is the question. What is the induction or inductance of the solenoid? Hmm. What's the definition of my inductance? At the end of the day, I would like to find out the following. I would like to find out the voltage here. This voltage will be L times di dt. Okay. Why is there a voltage? Because there is a magnetic field changing with time, if the current is changing. Okay, if I assume a current I is flowing in my solenoid, what is the magnetic field? How do I calculate the magnetic field in that system? I can use Ampere's law. So I'll say, okay, here is my Ampere's law. B dot DL is mu zero I in. I will not go through the calculation again, but B is going to be mu zero times I of T times N turns divided by the total length of my solenoid. We've done this many times. Hmm. Now, what is the flux? through my solenoid. I have the magnetic field. What's the definition of magnetic flux? Question? No. Definition of magnetic flux is magnetic field times the area. So the flux here will be pi times r square. It's a uniform electric field all through the the uniform magnetic field all through the cross section, pi r square times b. But now be very careful. When I change this phi b, d phi b dt is going to be voltage on a single turn. However, in this solenoid, I have n turns, right? Each of them will experience a voltage V that is in series with all others. So what I need is maybe I need phi total. The total magnetic flux through the solenoid will be n times the flux through only one of the loops. So what is that? Let me write everything now. Pi n pi r square. Now b is apparently mu zero n over l <coughs> times i of t. Okay. Hmm. So, 
phi total is pi r square mu zero n square over l times <coughs> i of t. What would the voltage be? Voltage will be d phi total dt. Everything except the magnetic field is a except the current is a constant. That's going to be pi r square, not l mu zero n over h. I call this h. pi r square mu zero n square over h times d i d t. So the inductance of my solenoid is apparently pi r square mu zero n square over h. Now What does this tell me? I mean, what's the feeling I should get for this inductance? What does it mean if I have large inductance? And what does it mean if I have small inductance? <coughs> it again goes back to Lenz's law. If a circuit has large inductance, it resists the change of the current. For example, and we are going to do this in more detail, if I have a voltage source here, a resistor and an inductor, and if I close the circuit, what happens? What do I expect? I expect some current to run. If I had zero inductance, that current, which would be V over R, would run momentarily. Just as soon as I close the switch, the current will start to run. But when I actually have inductance, large inductance, it will take, I, mean, I cannot make the current jump. If I try to make the current jump, that means there is a large change of I. The I dt will be very high, there will be very high voltage. So what we will see is that the current in that circuit so we're going to see this next time, will rise slowly to its final value. So the inductor, the larger my inductance is going to be, the slower will be the rise of the current. Actually, there are almost none of uh, those left around, but old radios and old TVs. When you turn on an old analog TV, you did not see or you did not hear the radio or the TV right away. The voice or the uh, screen came on slowly. Okay. And it's even more importantly when you took it off. When you turned the power off, again the voice went off slowly. Right? Why was that? Because in those old TVs and old uh, radios, there are huge coils, huge inductors. What happens is that even though you want to make all the currents zero, you cannot make them go to zero in a millisecond. It takes a few seconds because of the large inductance of the circuits. Practically the only large inductances left around you are in your charging devices for your laptops. Uh, this one doesn't have a light indicator on it, but for many laptop chargers, even when you take them off the power, you see that the light is on for maybe two seconds, maybe five seconds. Why is that? Because there are big inductors inside these devices. So, moral of the story, large inductance means large resistance to change of current. All right? I'll see you on Wednesday.